Hello, welcome to Just the Dis. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And today I'm going to talk about three recent criterions. Get a sense of which ones I'm talking about. Let's get into this. Okay, so this one I was really, really excited about from the moment it was announced. This is the Parallax View from 1974, Alan J. Pakula's film, the second in his quote-unquote paranoid trilogy or paranoia trilogy. And this movie is fantastic. It is just one of those things where I think I read about it in a Danny Perry book, probably the cult movies one or two. I can't remember which one it's in, but it intrigued me. And I wasn't like a huge Warren Beatty fan at the time. Like I hadn't seen Shampoo and I, I just hadn't absorbed enough of his great work in the 70s. And he's so good in this. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so this movie, for those that don't know, I'll just do a quick uh, show and tell here. Uh, so you can see what we're dealing with. Um uncompressed manoral soundtrack that's what we got on the inside I'm gonna take out this booklet um, okay so what is the parallax view it is a movie that uh, I guess Pakula who by the way if you don't know the other parts of his paranoid trilogy you have first Clute, which is also a criterion, obviously, and All the President's Men. And if you watch all three of these films together, um, I can't believe it won't creep you out <laughs> a little bit. Uh, especially Parallax, although All the President's still really resonates and is just a great thriller, uh, as is Clute. You know, all, all three shot by Gordon Willis, and he will come up in a minute here because... He's, um, an interview with him is included on the Parallax disc, but definitely check out Clute and All the President's Men if you haven't seen these, because they are fantastic. But, so Parallax is the story of a journalist, played by Warren Beatty, who is present on the day of an assassination of a prominent senator who was sort of making a bid for the presidency and who, you know, by his own admission is uh, kind of a, a wild card in terms of his party leanings. At least that's what he says at the very beginning, right before he's killed uh, on the Space Needle. Not to spoil too much, but that's the very beginning of the movie, sort of the impetus for the story, if you will. So Warren Beatty is present, but there are some other people that are closer to the actual assassination that could have witnessed who did it. And uh, Beatty isn't allowed to go up into the Space Needle to see it. Uh, Paul Apprentice is a, another reporter who is actually there and witnesses the assassination. So it's a big deal and the uh, you know there's some kind of investigation and they decide that the gunman the shooter who killed the senator acted alone and there was no conspiracy, but we can tell from the beginning that there's definitely something going on. And um, I don't want to give away too much, but basically people that were there on that day start to have bad things happen to them. And Warren Beatty's character begins to investigate that. And he comes across this organization called Parallax, the Parallax organization, I think. Um, and I'm not going to go too much further than that because I really want people to enjoy as much of the film blind as they can, but know that it is incredibly creepy and it sort of forewarns and predicts um, the society we live in today where we are watched all the time and, you know, Privacy is a thing of the past, really. And so it's it's just a great thriller in that way in terms of the, you know, setting up 
who Warren Beatty's character is, and he actually has to give sort of a nuanced performance because he has to, at some point, sort of pretend to be someone else in order to further his investigation. And so he's playing, and this is something that Alex Cox comments on in his really nice introduction to the film, which is about a 15-minute um, uh, recorded interview that's part of this disc. And it's this great idea that Beatty is playing these multiple layers. He's playing this reporter, he's playing this other guy, and it's just a really nuanced performance in a lot of ways, and it's one of his best performances. Um, but between that and the general sense of dread and the incredible, as always, Gordon Willis cinematography, uh, the movie just gets me every time. Like, it really is one of those incredible 70s films that stands out for me as one of the best of that decade, and it's a really strong decade. So if you like this sort of thriller, I can't recommend The Parallax View highly enough. Now, in terms of the features, we have... Uh, these interviews so like I said you have a Gordon Willis interview that's 18 minutes and he talks about all kinds of things in this interview in terms of his approach and his shooting style he talks about shooting for contrast from light to dark dark to light big to small small to big um, and you start to notice those thematic things those sort of overarching design ideas that he does that really makes his shots uh, stand out like they're really memorable in terms of what he shoots and how he shoots it and the lighting uh, obviously he shot the Godfather and people always remember uh, I think they called him the Prince of Darkness for that one but he's not just about darkness although Clute is an incredible portrait of a darkness uh, the way that he shoots Clute is borderline horror you know it's so good um, and this has got a little more daytime sequences to it, but there's definitely a lot of shadows for people to hide in, you know? And um, so it's a, just a gorgeous-looking movie. But uh, one of the things he talks about in the interview, he's, he's, I think it's something like the Kurosawa approach, he says, which is basically that if we're sitting and talking in the film, the camera is sitting still and, talk and you know, staying with that conversation. And when we're moving the camera is all moving. So if, if you notice in the movie, when people start to move, the camera starts to move. And it's a really interesting idea that he has in terms of that philosophy. Um, but I hadn't thought about it, and I hadn't thought about how Kurosawa does it and how he's taking his cues from Kurosawa, and that was super cool. Um, anyway, there's two interviews with Alan Pakula, and both are great, uh, just in terms of he's incredibly well-spoken and intelligent, um, one of my favorite filmmakers to hear interviewed. He's just obviously really thinking out his approach to each movie, and I just I love to hear him talk about the stuff. So both of those are great. Uh, and then there's this Alex Cox introduction. Alex Cox, of course, director of Repo Man, Sid and Nancy, and others. Um, and he does a great job with the film in terms of giving it context uh, he talks about some real-life parallels. Like, Pakula makes a point in one of his interviews, maybe it's in the booklet, actually, to say that he was not going out of his way to make a film that was in some way trying to give answers uh, in terms of the Kennedy assassination. Like, he's trying to set up a fictional senator, and obviously there will be you know things that kind of uh, line up, but he wasn't trying to go in saying, like, I have the answers and my movie will reveal them to you. It was just more uh, setting up this story, which will seem creepily familiar in terms of, you know, the Kennedy assassination, both uh, JFK and Robert Kennedy. Um, so anyway, he, he also talks about, like, you know, just some people that disappeared and, and how that sort of parallels some of the characters in this movie. Um that's Alex Cox, that is. And he also talks about films that came out around this time that were also, you know, sort of those paranoid thrillers. Like, uh, he, he mentions Executive Action with Burt Lancaster. He mentions The Conversation. He mentions Chinatown. And, um, 
yeah, it's just a really nice intro. I really enjoyed it. So, uh, and the transfer looks great. And, uh, you know, having Gordon Willis cinematography in the best possible uh, format in a nice new transfer is wonderful. And so highly, highly recommended. Definitely check out the Parallax View. One of my favorites. So, um, oh, and get our booklet. And um, it has something called Dark Towers by Nathan Heller. And uh, there's an interview with Pakula that I mentioned. And, yeah, it's it's. I was just checking out the interview. Very good stuff. And that's different than the interviews that you get in the actual disc. Um, so very thorough. Just one of my favorites of 2021 so far. Okay, so next up we have Smooth Talk. This is from 1985, I believe. And um, this is directed by Joyce Chopra, who I talked about briefly uh, previously on the channel when I mentioned uh, Claudia Wiles' film Girlf Girlfriends um, because there's a short on the Girlfriends Blu-ray, also Criterion, that is called Joyce at 34, and Joyce Chopra is the co-director and star of that documentary. It's about her having her first child and sort of trying to figure out how she's going to continue to be a filmmaker and work in film once she's had her baby, and it's fascinating. I think I gave uh, some praise to that on the video where I talked about girlfriends, but uh, this is more Joyce Chopra and... It's pretty cool, this disc, for many reasons, one of which is that we get uh, more Joyce Chopra shorts. So Joyce at 34 is here on this disc as well, uh, as well as one from 1975 called Girls at 12. Uh, that's I want to say that's about 30 minutes. And then one called uh, Chloré and Albie from 1975. Um and uh, Girls at 12 is really fascinating stuff. It's sort of focused on, again, this is a documentary short, focused on three girls, all 12 years old, living outside of Boston, I believe, in 1975. And so we just get a sense of what their lives are like, the pressures they're feeling in terms of, um, you know, what to do with their lives. Not that they're being pressured to decide at 12 years old, but... Just in terms of some of the academic stuff, it's really interesting. They talk to some of their teachers and, uh, you know, they talk to the girls who are kind of boy crazy. And, yeah, it's just a fascinating portrait. And there's an interview with uh, Joyce Chopra on here, and she talks about, you know, getting into the documentary filmmaking and all this stuff. And she mentions Girls at 12 and how there are bits of it that actually found their way into Smooth Talk, which is adapted from a short story, I believe. Um, and yeah, so there's actual scenes, like there's a scene with this girl um, putting some beads together on a necklace in, in Girls at 12, and we see that mirrored later in Smooth Talk, where Laura Dern is doing exactly that, and there's a couple conversations that are kind of worked their way into Smooth Talk, which I think is really interesting. So it's neat to watch Girls at 12 before you watch Smooth Talk. Uh, I do recommend that if you can. Um, anyway, this movie, uh, I'm just curious how they define it on the back because it's it's an interesting film for sure, one that will linger with you a bit. Um, it says, Suspended between, between carefree youth and the harsh realities of the adult world, a teenage girl experiences an unsettling awakening in this haunting vision of innocence lost. Based on Joyce Carol Oates' celebrated short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? The narrative debut from Joyce Chopra features a revelatory breakout performance by Laura Dern as Connie, the 15-year-old black sheep of her family, whose summertime idyll of beach trips, mall hangouts, and innocent flirtations is shattered by an encounter with a mysterious stranger, uh, a memorable menacing Treat Williams. Winner of the grand jury prize at Sundance, Smooth Talk captures the thrill and terror of adolescent sexual exploration as it transforms the conventions of a coming-of-age story into something altogether more troubling and profound. So there's Treat 
and uh, Laura Dern on the cover. Here's the back. This one also is uncompressed monaural soundtrack. There's our disc and our booklet. I'm just curious about this booklet. I do love that they do tables of contents in their booklets. Uh, so you have cast, credits, uh, essay called Girl Power by Honor Moore, When Characters from the Page Are Made Flesh on the Screen by Joyce Carol Oates, and the Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been uh, short story by Joyce, Joyce Carol Oates is in here as well. So that's cool. You can read that. You can find it online if you wanted to, I believe. But... It's nice that they put it in the disc. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting movie because it is like these three young girls. I think they're 15 in the movie. Uh, I want to say Laura Dern was 18 when she made the film. This is a year before uh, Blue Velvet, a uh, couple years after Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains. She had definitely you know, done films before this. But yeah, it is a big, uh, I can see the word breakout you know, applying, uh, perfectly because she really does carry the film and she does a great job as this sort of self-obsessed young teen girl who is just, again, sort of boy crazy and going out with boys, uh, trying to pick them up, but not really knowing exactly what she wants out of that interaction. Uh, her mother is played by Mary Kay Place and they are sort of always at odds uh, her dad isn't particularly, I mean, he's, he's kind, but he's not really present. Um, and yeah, then she meets this Treat Williams guy. Uh, his character's name is Arnold Friend, and he is super creepy. And he's got one extended scene that is just very chilling. Um, you know, but at the same time, he has this charm about him that's really unsettling you know in terms of the appeal he may or may not have for the Laura Dern character but anyway really interesting film to see them sort of hanging out and uh going to the mall and and doing the stuff it mentioned on the back there and I hadn't seen this in probably 10 years and I remembered the ending I thought but um the ending is the part that is adjusted a bit from the short story and I guess uh Joyce Carol Oates uh, liked the way they adjusted the ending, and it is a an interesting ending for sure. Um, but I do recommend you look up the short story and the inspiration for the short story because it does sort of inform your viewing in a way, and it helped me with the tension that's there. Um, anyway, I don't want to give away too much. I'm getting vague here. I don't want to do that. Um, but uh, an incredible performance from both Laura Dern and Treat Williams, uh, and a movie that I think is very, very underseen. So great to get a spotlight uh, from Criterion. Um, new 4K uh, restored digital transfer. Same thing for this. New 4K re restored digital uh, transfer for uh, Parallax. Um, conversation among Chopra, uh, author Joyce Carol Oates, and actor Laura Dern from the 2020 New York Film Festival, moderated by Turner Classic Movies host Alicia Malone. That's about an hour. Um, that, that's pretty cool to have on here. Uh, great discussion. Uh, the new interview with Chopra I mentioned. Uh, new conversations with Chopra and actors Treat Williams and Mary Kay Place, moderated by Alicia Malone. Also very good. And new interview with production designer David Wasco, who I always know is Wes Anderson's guy. Like I know he's worked with Wes Anderson a lot. Um, so very interesting to hear about an earlier, uh, job for him, you know, uh, then we have the KPFK Pacifica radio interview with, uh, Chopra from 1985, the shorts I mentioned, audio reading of the 1966 Life Magazine article, The Pied Piper of Tucson, uh, which inspired the short story by, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Um and uh, the booklet and everything. So very nice disc and well worth a pickup if you're a Laura Dern fan or Treat Williams fan or just a fan 
of movies about uh, sort of sort of coming of age movies, maybe with a little tension uh, in them. You know, there's there's definitely something unsettling about it. You know, really unsettling, but compelling. So that is smooth talk. And then last but definitely not least, we have three films by Bunuel. Uh, honestly, this is the one I have not had time to dig into at all, but uh, I will open it up and give you guys a look to see what is included here. So this is um, sort of a... this kind of a design. You can see what uh, we're dealing with in terms of these are not uh, Amory cases. Obviously, this is uh, cardboard cases. Uh, these are the films that you're getting in this set. You have, of course, first That Obscure Object of, of Desire. Uh, this is from 1977. Um, uh, Louis Bunuel's final film brings full circle the director's lifelong pre preoccupation with the darker side of desire. Bunuel regular Fernando Rey plays Mathieu, an urban widower, tortured by his lust for the elusive Conchita. With subversive flair, Bunuel uses two different actors in the latter role, Carol Bouquet, a sophisticated French beauty, and Angela Molina, a Spanish coquette. Drawn from the surrealistic favorite Pierre-Louis classic erotic novel La Femme et la Plantine, The Woman and the Puppet, from 1898, that obscure object of desire is... A dizzying game of sexual politics punctuated by a terror that harks back to Bunuel's avant-garde beginnings. This one I have seen. It's been a while, but I do remember it being a very interesting watch, uh, as all Bunuel watches are. But the choice to use two different actors for that female role is fascinating and a bit jarring, uh, but I do like it, and I, I I'll always remember that in terms of this movie. Um, new transfer here, uh, monaural, uncompressed soundtrack, interview with the screenwriter from 2000, uh, a Lady Doubles, a 2017 documentary featuring actress Carol Bouquet and Angela Molina, who share the role of Conchita in the film. Portrait of an impatient filmmaker, Louis Bunuel, a 2012 documentary featuring director of photography Edmund Richard and the assistant uh, director Pierre Larry, Larry, <laughs> excerpts from Jacques de Barancelli's 1929 silent film La Femme et Elle Le Pantin, an adaptation of the same novel uh, as this film is based on, and uh, a few more things here. But um, this is a Region A disc, so you know. So that is that obscure object of desire. Then we have. Uh, I'll go this way. Uh, we'll be we're all over the place in time here, but the the Phantom of Liberty. Um, this is one I have not seen, uh, and am very curious about. I've heard good things about it. Uh, it says Louis Bunuel's vision of the inherent absurdity of human social rituals reaches its taboo annihilating extreme in what may be his most morally subversive and formally audacious work. Zigzagging across time and space from the Napoleonic era to the present day, the Phantom of Liberty unfolds as a picaresque, a picaresque, uh, uh, its characters traveling down between a uh, tableau and a series of Dadaist non sequiturs. The unbound, uh, unbound by the laws of narrative logic, Bunuel lets his surrealist id run, run riot in an exuberant revolt against. Uh, bourgeois rationality that seems telegraphed directly from his unconscious to the screen. That is fascinating. I'm into it. I definitely got to see this one. Um, so this one has... Uh, here's what uh, the inside looks like. It's another one that's Region A. Um... Uh, let's see here. New high definition digital restoration with uncompressed monaural soundtrack. Interview with the screenwriter from 2000. Uh, analysis from uh, film scholar Peter William Evans from 2017. Episode of the French television series Pour la Cinema from 1974 featuring actors 
Michael Pocoli and Jean-Claude Briali. Uh, episode of the French television program Le Dernier des Sancs from 1974 featuring Briali. Documentary from 1985 about producer Serge Silberman, who worked with Louis Benwell on five of the director's final seven films um, and a new English, English translation. So that is Phantom of the Liberty. And then last but most definitely the one I'm most excited to rewatch uh, as I haven't seen it since the Criterion DVD, which has been out of print for some time, and that is The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, um, which is one of my favorites of Bunuel's films. In terms of, uh, you know, satire and absurdism, it's just, it's really a fascinating, I use that word a lot when I talk about these kind of movies. It's just absolutely mesmerizing and unusual and unforgettable. And, you know, one of those movies that is like an art film, but... I don't know. It's not, it's not, I don't want to say art films are stuffy, but they can be for my money sometimes. But these Bunuel films are, they have that art, you know, house aesthetic, but there's so much more going on. Um, it says in Louis Bunuel's deliciously satiric masterpiece, an upper middle class sextet sits down to a dinner that is continually delayed. Their attempts to eat thwarted by vaudevillian events, both actual and imagined, including terrorist attacks, military maneuvers, and ghostly apparitions, uh, stringing together a discontinuous, digressive series of absurdist set pieces, Bunuel and his screenwriting partner Jean-Claude Carrière send a cast of a European film greats, uh, Fernando Rey, Stéphane Audran, Delphine Sirig, Jean-Pierre Cassel, and Boulle Auger, uh, through a maze of desire, deferred, frustrated, and interrupted. The Oscar-winning pinnacle of Benwell's late career sent uh, as a fetid maestro of the international art house. The discreet charm of the bourgeoisie is one of the most gleefully radical assaults on the values of the ruling class. This is from 1972. So it's the earliest of the three. I actually went in reverse order there. Um, but yeah, just really, really excellent film. And this one has... The biggest uh, booklet that I think covers all three films. Let me look at the table of contents. So you have uh, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, more or less, by Adrian Martin. Phantom of Liberty, The Serpentine Movements of Chance by Gary Indiana. Uh, that Obscure Object of Desire, uh, Desire Denuded by Adrian Martin and then interviews with Louis Bunuel as well, all contained therein. And um, yeah, I just cannot wait to dig into this set, so I apologize that I didn't get a chance to do so before uh, showing it to you guys, but I really wanted to make everyone aware of what is in this set and how worthwhile it is to pick up if you're a fan of Bunuel or if you're thinking of becoming a fan of Bunuel. Um, this, this is the jam. You definitely want to get this. This will set you up with uh, a good sense of who he is as a filmmaker and his style and his humor and surrealism. It's a great group of films. Obviously, I haven't seen all of them. I haven't seen Phantom of Liberty, but I can tell that it's going to line right up with these other two. Uh, so this is a really nice... You know, I know we're used to the big box sets. We've got the, you know, Fellini set. We've got the... Um, what else have I got up there? The Godzilla, the uh, the um, hang on a sec. Bergman and Agnes Varda. I mean, those are great. Those are you know huge sets. This is just a nice little mini, and um, definitely worth a pickup. Uh, I feel like this one didn't get quite the hoorah that some of those bigger box sets got, but well, well worth uh, adding to your collection. So. Uh, that will do it for this little uh, Criterion uh, chat. Uh, hopefully there's something in here for you to enjoy. Let me know if you picked up any Criterions recently, if there's any that you're looking forward to in the comments below. I'd love to hear it. And uh, like uh, this video if you do. And subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more like this. And hit the little bell thing and everything. Um, anyway, thank you guys. I'll talk to you later.